Hello and welcome back to another game review. Today I'm going to be covering The Lords of the Fallen. I'm reviewing this game over any other because it has a reboot coming in a few weeks and I think it would be interesting to see how it compares. Lords of the Fallen was developed by Deck 13 and released in 2014, the same year as at Dark Souls 2, and because of that I'll be comparing the two games a bit. Lords of the Fallen possesses a strong core gameplay experience, but its shortcomings arise from decisions made in other aspects of the game design, ultimately diminishing its overall quality. The core gameplay mechanics are both Lords of the Fallen greatest strengths and its greatest weaknesses. To start off, the controls are remarkably similar to Dark Souls 2, however it expands on the main mechanics of attacking in a few ways. Firstly, by having the running attack tied to the heavy attack button, and having it be comparatively slower compared to Dark Souls 2, where it is a fast attack. The second way is introducing charged heavy attacks, which increases the damage of the attack at the cost of a greater wind-up and stamina consumption. The last way attacking is different is the Gauntlet, a projectile weapon with multiple settings that uses mana. Outside of that, it plays more or less the same as Dark Souls 2 and other Souls-like games, both in controls and in the core gameplay loop. That leads to its greatest weaknesses, the recover times, floaty combat, and the camera shape. Having a long recovery time isn't necessarily bad, however, the way they went about it makes the game feel unresponsive, and if you have ever played a Souls like before, you know just how important responsive combat is to the core gameplay of loop. The recovery time doesn't just apply to the player, but also to the bosses. This isn't really a bad thing since the player has such long recovery times, but the boss recovery time is very excessive to compensate. Uh, floaty combat really comes down to their inclusion in what Dark Souls calls passive poise. If you don't know what that is, it is where you will not be stunned by enemies' attacks when you are hit if your poise is high enough, and the reason this is a problem is because it doesn't provide any feedback to the player that they are making a mistake, allowing them to face tank everything without thinking about dodging. The enemies can also spin on a dime, meaning you can't strafe around them effectively to backstab them. As one Steam user put it, every one of these no good rascals comes equipped with an invisible record player which they stand upon. What this means for Mighty Jellyman is that all these cads he encounters can swivel on the spot without moving their feet. The last major flaw is the camera shake. What can I say that will do it justice? It's nauseating at best and unplayable at worst. I can't believe the developers thought it was okay to release the game with a camera shake this bad. Now that the core gameplay elements are out of the way, let's look at the bosses. The bosses are more or less all gimmick fights, and I want to break them down to look at how they function and if the gimmick is detrimental to the fight. The tutorial boss is the first warden, and overall I would call it a very good tutorial boss. It isn't hard by any means, but it teaches the player how to strafe and look for openings, which is the most important thing about the Souls formula. The first Warden gets more aggressive in each phase of his fight and implements new moves in each phase. And it makes for a very interesting boss, although it being reused later in the game makes it feel less unique. The Champion is the next boss I fought and the next boss we will look at. Champion is a very weak boss, it is supposed to be a brawler type boss that will charge and catch you in combos, which is very good design in most games but he'll just sit for the majority of the fight and throw out the same two punch combo and spin on his record player and occasionally throw out an AoE or a charge. His recovery I think is good, but I can't tell because his AI idles after every attack and his combo gimmick doesn't really impact the fight because it's really hard to get hit by them if you are strafing. And I can only assume they're going for a fight similar to what Flame Lurker is like in Demon Souls. The next boss is Commander, and he hides behind his shield and occasionally throws out attacks that you are supposed to punish in that window, which again is a good, if a bit annoying, design in most games. The problem with this gimmick in Lords of the Fallen is that he doesn't have enough moves, and he isn't aggressive enough to make the fight interesting. He has a large sweep in front of him, a projectile fired from his sword, a shield slam AoE, a bullet rain attack that I never attempted to dodge and didn't get hit by, 
and a move where he turtles behind his shield and summons enemies. With how passive his AI is, you will rarely see most of these attacks outside of the AoE. Worshipper is one of my favorite bosses despite having a simple moveset and easy to counter gimmick. He has two attacks outside of the gimmick AoE, a basic two hit chain, and an AoE that stuns. The gimmick is that you have to run to the shrines before the AoE happens to avoid taking massive damage. The reason I like this fight is because out of all the bosses I've talked about so far, he is actually aggressive and doesn't idle after attacks. This makes the fight very smooth. The Infiltrator is another very aggressive boss and another one that I like a lot. It reminds me a lot of the Quayleg fight in the positioning you have to do, and I could definitely see how it could fit in with Dark Souls or Dark Souls 2 boss design. Beast is the next boss and is another gimmick boss where the gimmick ruins the fight. The fight revolves around you snipping at his ankles until he falls over so you can smack his head to deal massive damage. It's a gimmick that always seems to fall flat in every game it's tried in, and unfortunately it's no exception here. The Guardian is an optional boss, which is really a shame because it is my favorite boss and the boss that most clicks with the game mechanics, offering a great blend of moves that punish sloppy gameplay with an aggressive AI and recovery times that are long enough to punish with a few hits but not long enough to stand around and wail on the Guardian. If every boss was made to this quality, I think I would have enjoyed this game a lot more. The Annihilator is a very good example of the janky combat and shallow move pools that the game has. He has a beam attack that locks you in place in a very janky animation, and he only used one attack chain the entire fight. During my fight with him, I got launched skyward for whatever reason and then got ragdolled. The Lost Brother duo fight is the second to last base game boss fight, and it's really underwhelming. It is an attempt at an Ornstein and Smo style boss fight, but it lacks the focus that made that fight good. For starters, one of the biggest things that made the Ornstein and Smo fight good was the speed that both fighters operated at. Ornstein was fast and aggressive, and Smo was slow and fairly passive. This is something that not even Trump Software could replicate despite their many attempts, so I'm not surprised that Deck 13 was unable to do so. Another thing that drags this fight down is that both Lost Brothers have AoEs that they spam, so if you get bad RNG and both are aggroed on you at once, then it's very hard to get in damage. The final major flaw is it will sometimes trill on the ceiling, and I suspect that Deck 13 did this to break up the aggro, but when they come down they have a massive AoE that stuns and does high damage. The final boss fight is against the Judge, and it's an underwhelming, janky fight, and I couldn't tell what was going on half the time. It perfectly encapsulates the game's bosses, where most are bad, either due to being janky or just not having fleshed out gimmicks or movesets. A few things that make the good bosses good are also in this fight, like the aggressive AI and moves that punish mistakes, but they are just barely visible underneath the mediocrity. The biggest problem I have with this fight is the jankiness, where multiple attacks throughout multiple phases he will float off the ground and can launch you in the air for seemingly no reason. His gimmick also isn't that flushed out. He will summon weak enemies, then jump out of reach and snipe you with a beam that does three times his normal damage until he feels like coming down. Overall, the bosses in this game are mediocre to bad, with a few good bosses. Next, I want to talk about the plot and progression of the game. The progression is really simple, as there are only six true areas with a bunch of sub-areas. After a brief introduction cutscene, you find yourself in the first area of the game with the wizard Kazlo as your companion. The first area is the Keystone Citadel tutorial, a small level that does a good job at introducing you to the level design that you should expect while playing the game. After beating the first warden, Kazlo gets injured and you have to go find him leading to the next area. The second area is the Keystone Monastery, and I really like the design of it because while it's basically a straight line to the bosses, there are a lot of paths that it can take to get to the same destination. You fight the commander and the worshipper on your way to find Kazlo. Once you find Kazlo, you open a portal to the abandoned temple. The abandoned temple is the next major area, and it is the first time you are introduced into the Rogar realm. 
I like the design of the area, but I feel like you could have done more to differentiate between Keystone as the only major differences is the older style stonework and the unwelcoming metalwork that adorns the stone walls and floors. Your goal in the abandoned temple is to find a way to destroy the rift between realms. A blacksmith you find in the temple tells you that there is a crystal that you must take from the Rogar. After a fight with the infiltrator, you make your way back to the blacksmith and give him the crystal. Your mission now accomplished, you go back to your realm and travel through the catacombs to tell Kazlo and the leader of the human defense, Antanas. The catacombs are a messy labyrinth of tunnels, and since I had completed it early, I had unlocked a shortcut that allowed me to bypass most of the level. The champion guards the final path out of the catacombs and must be killed. Upon reaching Kazlo and Atanas, they tell you the only true way to stop the Rogar is to kill all the lords, so you set back out to the Rogar realm. Outside of the church, you are ambushed by a beast, and after a quick fight, you return to the abandoned temple where you fight Guardian and gain access to the inner sanctum of the temple, the Chamber of Lies. In the Chamber of Lies, you find the last Rorgar Lord, the Annihilator. Upon the Annihilator's defeat, you talk to God, and he tells you to kill Antanas. God sends you into the depths of the Keystone Citadel, and in order to climb to the top, you have to kill the Lost Brother Duo. After reaching the top, you find the Judge, and after beating you, the game ends and you get sent in a new game plus. The levels themselves weren't that bad, but they definitely don't compare to the likes of Dark Souls 2. The plot doesn't have much depth, which is a shame because the story is almost as important as the bosses in Souls Likes. The last thing I want to touch on before the DLC content is the graphics, art design, sound, and music. The graphics have aged very well for being launched in 2014, and it far, far exceeds Dark Souls 2 in terms of graphical fidelity. I would say that other AAA games that came out in 2014 do look better, like Grand Theft Auto 5 and Shadow of Mordor, although it is very close to being as good as Grand Theft Auto 5. The art design and direction rivals from software in its grandiose design, which you can see in the boss and enemy design specifically. The same thing can be said of the music. It rivals the soundtrack from Dark Souls 2, which in my opinion is from software's best work to date. I am really looking forward to listening to the new Lords of the Fallen OST, and I hope it exceeds the heights that this game reached. Unfortunately, the rest of the sound design is not that notable. Like, with the bosses, it is mediocre at best. Maybe you could help us. The DLCs are perhaps the worst parts of the game because Deck 13 offered 6 DLC packs, two of which are stat and spell boost packs, both of which cost $2. The next three DLCs are weapon, armor, and artifacts. These also cost $2 and unlock exclusive weapons and armor sets that are immediately outclassed outside of the tutorial area. None of these DLCs are worth buying, and they offer nothing of value to the game, even if you have them. This brings us to the last DLC, and the only one to provide a new area and a new boss. The Ancient Labyrinth adds a small puzzle area that takes around 20 minutes to get through, and the boss is another gimmick boss. The Keeper summons a shield that you have to destroy. Upon doing so, he will use an insta-kill AoE, to, so you have to quickly run behind cover so you don't get one shot. The reward for killing the boss is one of three weapons, and one of three armor sets, meaning you need to go into New Game++ Plus Plus to get everything from this DLC. Unlike the base game, there are no saving graces for any of the DLCs, and at $18 for all of them, you are better off burning your money instead of buying them. In conclusion, Lords of the Fallen offers an interesting take on the Souls-like genre, but it falls short of achieving the same level of excellence as its inspiration. It excels in certain areas such as core gameplay, graphics, art design, and music, but it struggles with its boss battle, DLC, and narrative depth. As the game receives a reboot, it will be fascinating to see whether Deck 13 can address these shortcomings 
and deliver an improved experience for players. And so Harkin defied a god. He cast the rune aside and struck Antanas down using only his sword. And in the end, he cast that rune aside, restoring the forces of the world back into balance. Harkin found the balance even between the power of his sword and magic, using both means to defeat all manner of Rogar lords and man-made creatures. Despite the markings on his face, he proved himself to be a compassionate man who showed mercy to the just and unjust alike. Harkin proved himself to be a warrior, not a scholar. The secrets of this world did not interest him, even when they were only an arm's reach away. He chose to turn a blind eye to Antanas's dark experiments. Thanks to Harkin, Yetka was able to reunite with her family. The crafter's crystal was returned to him. He went back to his dimension travels and studying the runes. Harkin sealed the fate of both realms for many years to come. Historians of the future will forever wonder what the world could have been if Harkin's choices had been different. <laughs>